nothing kills a person faster than dehydration, and we're seeing this with Ebola victims. Death rates range between 50 and 100 percent, and most are caused by dehydration. Yet a solution of sugar, salts and water, many of which can be found in a kitchen cupboard, can be all it takes to save a life, a solution which has already saved an estimated 50 million people worldwide. The Lancet has described this oral rehydration therapy as potentially the most important medical advance of the 21st century. And UNICEF says that no other medical innovation of the century has had the potential to prevent so many deaths over such a short period of time and at so little cost. Well, our first guest this evening played a key part in developing this solution. His name is Dr. Norbert Hirschhorn, and he joins us this evening. Thank you very much yes, indeed. Thank you. I mean, it's incredible to be able to say that you are credited with saving the lives of 50 million people. <laughs> I and many other people who worked on this subject, yes. Explain to us exactly how it does work. Oral rehydration therapy essentially uses the intestine to absorb necessary salts and water that have been lost, usually from diarrheal disease. And it, you can also do it with intravenous therapy, but that's much more expensive and takes certain expertise to be able to, to do. Whereas oral rehydration therapy is, is now known, you can, one can do it in the home if the parent or the mother a caretaker have been trained in its use. And how vital is it in the treatment of Ebola? Well, to my knowledge, Ebola uh, really is a disease that affects the intestinal tract and, and other organs, but there's a great deal of vomiting and diarrhea and dehydration. And many of the patients who die may die of dehydration well even before they have the terrible hemorrhagic uh, effects of the virus in the later stage. So if they were better hydrated, would that mean that they would be better able then to fight those other elements of the, of the virus? Well, it, at least they would be out of shock. And shock itself is a, causes the, uh, the hemorrhaging that occurs. Now, I don't know that there's been a proper study or understanding of using oral rehydration solutions for the Ebola patients that we now see. Right. Uh, I've asked the U.S. Centers for Disease Control if they're proposing to use the oral rehydration salts, and it certainly is in the WHO guidelines for treating these viral hemorrhagic fevers. So I think a, an effort to make these simple solutions available, UNICEF has stocks and stocks of them, uh, would, would be very useful to do as part of the regular overall treatment. Sure, because I mean, you know, we said th this is the stuff that people have in their kitchen cupboards, but is that so in places in Africa? Is well, it so I think you'd have to mobilize the people to understand what to do. You wouldn't want to be treating Ebola patients at home. But, you know, recognize that uh, even while this epidemic goes on, many tens and hundreds of thousands of more people are affected by diarrheal disease and by high fevers and other conditions that which, which will cause dehydration even as the epidemic goes on. So generally the whole medical system should be training not only health workers but also families in using rehydration fluids. Some of the ingredients certainly can be prepared at home. And we're not just talking about people who are sick with Ebola in this case, but, but other diseases too. In the case of Ebola, we're also talking about it helping the medical workers who are in those incredibly hot outfits. Yes, I've, I've seen them in these uh, hot outfits. I mean, they're covered from head to toe. Uh, do they sweat a lot? Are they impaired in their work by losing so much fluid? Would they benefit from rehydration? Uh, that they can do right on the spot without having to take everything off and put it back, all back on again. Uh, again, I don't know how this is working out and if there are major complaints on this, but it's something to think about. Well, indeed, I'd, I'd read that it, it took a couple of hours for them to rehydrate after an hour of working in yeah, those conditions. Yeah, someone has said that. Yeah. We certainly should get the evidence from the workers themselves. Yeah. On a wider level, what are the long-term effects on health of dehydration? I'm not talking about very serious episodes of dehydration, but, you know, those of us who perhaps don't drink as much as, as we ought to, are there studies into how that can affect health longer term? You know, we go back to the original source and, and, and cause and use of rehydration salts was for cholera patients. And once they were hydrated and the cholera vibrio disappeared uh, from their systems, uh, then they were fine. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if children have chronic bouts of diarrhea, several in a year, they'll develop malnutrition. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the things that oral rehydration therapy has done 
is to improve or protect the nutrition of children with bouts of diarrhea. Their appetite returns, they can feed, and so on. Um, in the long term, once you recover from a, a serious illness like that, with, and with recovery, you should be fine. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've had this with my own two-year-old. When he's had these episodes, you can go to the chemist yeah. and you can buy these rehydration sachets, and they're very right. useful. What about in parts of the world where you can't go to the pharmacy and pick those well, up? This is, this is the absolute problem of the outbreak, is we have a primary health care system that's not working. It's crumbling. Uh, one country spends 26 cents, pennies, a year per person for health care outlays. Yeah. We don't have a functioning health care system in many parts of the world from all kinds of political and, and, and other re economic reasons. Mm -hmm. But the simplest thing is to have a health care system that trains health workers, that provides the logistics for medicine, simple basic stuff, salts, water, uh, gloves, uh, things, I mean, things that would be in any uh, country that has a primary health care system. We're seeing, the, we're seeing the effects of the breakdown and the failure of those systems. Mm -hmm. But for people who don't have access to those systems that you're talking about in poor countries, I mean, what should they be giving people who are dehydrated? It's not just as simple as giving them a glass of water, is it? Things that they have perhaps in their own home. Again, it needs training. One can make a, a salt sugar solution from salts and sugar at right. home. Uh, Rice-based oral rehydration salts uh, is a very effective way of treating it. But again, we go back to building the infrastructure of health care, training of workers, training of community workers. Uh, and without that, it becomes very difficult every time some outbreak occurs. It could be cholera outbreaks, it could be Ebola. How did you come to find the importance of oral rehydration therapy? I what was working you? in the cholera research laboratory in what was then East Pakistan, now Bangladesh. Uh, we were f faced with an epidemic uh, that uh, used up almost all our intravenous resources. We understood from the scientific studies in animals that glucose and sodium, that is the sugar glucose and the uh, salt sodium, would mutually absorb with each other and water across the intestinal tract. Mm -hmm. And cholera was, and other diarrhea diseases was a, a disease that caused water outflow from the bloodstream into the intestine and out. Mm -hmm. And if you could reverse that flow with oral rehydration, glucose, salt, and water, uh, then you could save the person and, the, and their own body systems would then uh, eliminate the disease. Mm -hmm. In the introduction uh, to this interview, we, we said that you are credited with saving the lives of some 50 million people worldwide. I mean, that's almost incomprehensible, yes, yes, isn't yes, it? Yes. How yes. does knowing that make you feel? Well, I, I, I felt blessed to even be approached with that kind of number because I've been working in this field for several decades now. And it was an improvement of the information transfer and the training of workers around the world and the, the supply of the salts by the UNICEF and other agencies that made it possible now that uh, almost all parts of the world are familiar with this use and, and have been trained at home to use it. So we started from zero and we were now at a stage where we can think of it, this as a normal rational treatment. Well, I mean, it's just an incredible thing you've done. Do you, do you know, I mean, probably modesty prevents you from saying, but do you know if anyone else in the world can lay claim to sort of have had the kind of impact that you have had on worldwide Well, I health? don't claim it for myself. Uh, many, many health workers uh, all around the world have been involved. I really was at the, at the front end of it, uh, showing the, that it was possible to do. I helped organize a program that was on a national scale in Egypt to show how we trained workers and mothers and doctors uh, to use this therapy. And, you know, I just kept at it, and so, but so did so many other people. And it was a, it was a wonderful way to spend a lifetime. Mm -hmm. Very briefly, just to, to end this, I, I've been reading about your own personal history, your own childhood. You escaped uh, from the Nazis, the Nazis. And I just wonder how much of that own personal history has led you to this, to want to help other people. Well, we have a, we have a word in, in Hebrew called tikkun, which is to, to heal the world, tikkun olam to heal the world. And I think that my experience of escaping and my, my family's experience in escaping uh, brought me to that stage where I wanted to heal the world. Okay, well you certainly have done that. Norbert Herschel, it's been a pleasure having you on the program. Thank Thanks you so very much. much indeed.